Okay, so hello again, this time on behalf of the Water Footprint Group, um, which was one of the three cross-cutting topics and where we have developed um, some recommendations. So the starting point when we set together more than three years ago uh, was that seven uh, of the GROW project actually identified that they have something to do with the water footprint, more or less directly, um, either directly in the project title or somewhere in the, in the work packages. And then the idea was, okay, let's put our heads together and see if there are things where we can work together. So we had um, a workshop um, some years, three years ago pretty much, uh, where we are, were trying to find topics which are relevant for all of us. And there are things like integrating socio-economic aspects into the water footprint, how to link ground and surface water models, how can we model aquifer depletion, what about virtual water trade, how can that influence water stress and vice versa, many other topics. And some of them were, we were saying, okay, that is relevant for two or three projects, put your heads together and exchange. And there were also a few more where we said, okay, that is really relevant for a large group of the project and maybe even for the water communities and that's why we decided to continue our discussion and worked on recommendations. And to summarize them in three take-home messages, uh, which was not an easy task to select those, is the first one here is that we, that I think relates to your comment also, that we should take a more holistic perspective on the water footprint. So the numbers of liters of blue, green and grey water, they are relevant as such. So they can help to raise awareness for the problem. And also on a global perspective, these are relevant numbers. However, when it comes to assessing the local consequences of these numbers, then we need additional information. And to give you such an example, this is how such a, such a water scarcity map can look like on an annual basis based on the water gap uh, model. And if you then consider, for instance, one apple, which is produced let's now assume in New Zealand, then the 125 liter, if it's rain-fed agriculture, so green water consumption, that is water resources allocated to the production of apples, but it might not be a big local problem. It doesn't compete with the population, with drinking water or with other things. However, if we talk about other products like almonds, which have a water footprint of more than 10,000 liters per kilogram, and you can see on this picture a dam in California, that was how it looked uh, three years ago, last year it looked like this, then that is a big problem. So a liter of water is not a liter of water depending on the local context, and that's something where we say that should be taken into account in addition to the liters, because 90% of the water footprint studies that we see are exactly on that volumetric level, which I would not say that is not relevant, but I would, we would like to see more of these interpretation of these numbers. Another thing is to make use of the potential of this water footprint um, to influence a sustainable uh, water use. If we are talking about sustainable water management, then of course river basin management is important and all the hydrological models and water governance, all of that is very important. But maybe we should not forget that a large share of our water problems are man-made and they are a result of an unsustainable production and they are a result of an unsustainable consumption which is also associated to us. And the big strength of the water footprint is exactly to reveal that link. What has the water uh, depletion in that dam in uh, California to do with us if we are going over a Christmas market and eating some almonds? Maybe not in this year, so good news for California. Um, the next thing is then that this water footprint helps us to identify the hotspots where we can really change things. So I just mentioned that half an hour ago for companies that you can be also transferred to other levels. If you take us as consumers, then I think our direct water use is 127 liters per person and day. But also that is only the tip of the iceberg. If we have a look at our water footprint, then it's 6,000 liters per day because we are all wearing clothes, we are eating, etc. So if we want to save water resources, it might not be too efficient if we close the water tap when we brush our teeth, which we should still do, but it way, could be way more efficient if we avoid food waste, if we avoid fast fashion, these kind of things. This is where the leverage is. And the water footprint can help us to save water in the most efficient manner, whether it's on a personal level or it's on a company level, or if it's also on a government level. 
And the government level is this, um, the third aspect where we have recommendations in particular with regard to political decisions that we would vote for an analysis of what do trade flows do with the global water resources. This map which you see there is just by a recent um, project that we are doing on behalf of the Umweltbundesamt, so almost as nice as a BMBF project where we are analyzing the water footprint of Germany and the virtual water imports resulting from our consumption. And there the idea is that if we find the hotspots, where does our consumption cause water-related problems, that we provide incentives for more water-efficient water use there, that we steer specific technological development assistance in certain directions where it really makes a lot of sense. Also, I would like to mention that water is one very relevant aspect. And even though SDG 6, I guess, is all our favorite SDG, there are many other SDGs as well to consider. So we should avoid the trap of being eco-imperialists and say that we only do decisions based on water. We could very well go to Pakistan and say, we found the solution for all your water problems. From tomorrow on, we will buy the cotton from India. And Frank Andreas would need a bulletproof jacket for that, and it would not make much sense, because it might be a good idea for the water resources in Pakistan, but it's one aspect of many others. And for us, it's numbers. For many other millions, it's their livelihood. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything, but we should rather use these instruments to find the hotspots and try to assist people in saving water and not only focus on our German water resources. So that's the third message here in this regard. In terms of deliverables, we have um, a policy brief, which you can download and find also somewhere here, I guess, Annika. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is also about to be published uh, in a journal, so we have that under revision currently. Uh, we had an event uh, of, at the World Water Week uh, last year, where we have been presenting these, um, these recommendations, where we also have some projects from the GROW community presented in Stockholm. And also we had stakeholders from industry, from the Water Footprint Network, hello to the live stream, and where we could discuss these things further. And finally, we also have an online tool. Um, we have a couple of online tools in this funding measure. So that one is related to water footprint tools. So there are different methods, impact assessment methods, labels, standards, etc. And the idea of this tool is that you go there and if you want to know, I want to assess impacts on ecosystem, or I want to have a standard for industry or for agriculture, then this tool helps you to find the right tool for the right question. And these are the main deliverables from this cross-cutting topic. And thanks again on behalf of the entire water footprint crowd.